Okay, so thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar. My name is Ian Holmes. I'm joined today by my colleague Tom. Uh, we're both from the Geoservices support team here at Adena and we work on the Digimap project. And today we're going to give you a little overview about LiDAR Digimap, which is our latest collection that we added to the service. So after the webinar, you'll get an email um, with some links in it. We are recording this webinar and we'll host it on our YouTube channel. So we'll send you a link to that, uh, to the slides that we're going to go through today and a transcript of any questions and answers. There'll also be a feedback form will pop up at the end of this webinar. If you could take a couple of minutes to fill that in, that'd be really useful. Okay, so in terms of what we're going to cover today, uh, we're going to look at a little overview of what LiDAR data is, what data sets are available, how you access that data, and then we'll cover a few basic uses of um, LiDAR data as well. I'll try and give you a, a live demo of some of the stuff as well. So first thing, what is LiDAR data? So LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It's a process um, of capturing data from the air where they fire lasers at the ground and they measure the return rate from different wavelengths. And basically it's a way of capturing really detailed um, ground surface information and you can measure things like the size of the tree canopy the top of man-made features like buildings but you can also determine the ground surface from beneath that as well so what we have in lidar digimap is data lidar data for data that's available for the whole of the uk um, it's been collected by three separate government agencies so the environment agency for england the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, or SEPA for Scotland, and Natural Resources Wales for Wales. It's generally been captured for flood risk modelling um, by these three agencies. So it tends to cover um, river basins, coastal areas that have been susceptible to flooding. Um, so in terms of the coverage, uh, there's around 72% of England at the moment, 20% of Scotland and 70% of Wales. And it's been captured at a variety of different resolutions as well. So the most detailed data is 25 centimeter resolution, but it goes right up to two meters, which is the least detailed. The most detailed data has fairly sparse coverage. Um, so it's, it's generally just along rivers uh, and coastal areas, whereas the two meter data, the coarsest resolution stuff, is uh, quite widely available. And I'll show you some of the um, distributions of the data in a few minutes. So, yeah, so just be aware that at the moment the coverage can be patchy, but it is really detailed. And I've included there in the slide a comparison. So the most detailed terrain surface you can get from Ordnance Survey is a product called Ordnance Survey Terrain 5 DTM. And that has a 5 meter resolution. So each pixel, each uh, area is 5 meters by 5 meters. Whereas the um, LiDAR data goes right down to 25 centimeter resolution. So it's it's orders of magnitude more detailed. It's, uh, it's a really fantastic product if the data is available for your area. So just to clarify a little bit around the different types of data set that you can get from uh, LiDAR Digimap and that are available. So the first one is digital terrain model. So anybody that does 3D modeling uh, or is familiar with Ordnance Survey terrain data will be familiar with this type of data. So DTMs, digital terrain models, these are effectively bare earth models. So where all vegetation and man-made structures have been stripped off the earth. So it's what you would get if you scraped all the features off the top of the, uh, top of the ground. And it gives you an accurate terrain data set from which you can build up your 3D models. So in the little image at the bottom here, the little green line shows what you get for a digital terrain model. So basically it's the surface underneath all the other things that are on top of it. So here we've got trees, buildings, factories, things like that. So the green bit is the digital terrain model. And LiDAR data, because it's been captured over a number of years, it's available for download in two different versions. So there's what we call a composite. So if you choose that, you would get the latest data available for your area of interest. But if you're interested in um, measuring change over time, anything like that, you can actually download the data by year it was captured. So we make it available and we publish that by year as well. So if you want to see how your area has changed over time, then look at the by year data uh, and you can get it from there. So the second type of data is the digital surface model. And this is what you would see if you were to look out of an airplane or from a tall building um, this is the surface that you would see from the air effectively and in our little infographic at the bottom here that's what the red line is so the digital surface model 
uh, follows this red line. So it goes over the top of buildings, goes up over the top of trees, forests, and over the top of hills. So in some areas, it's obviously the same as a digital terrain model, where there's no features. But in other areas where things have been built up, then obviously it's different. And you can do analysis and use these two surfaces together, these two data sets together, to work out the volumes and the heights of things. Because obviously you've got the top of a building here, and you've also got the terrain height underneath it. So you can work out how tall these buildings are. And again, we make the digital surface model available in two versions. So we've got the composite and also the by year data for change over time type analysis. Now, the third set of data, I'm mentioning it third, although really this is the original source data that is captured, uh, is what we call point clouds. So point clouds are the raw data that are captured when um, companies go out and they scan the ground using LiDAR technology. Effectively, it's a series of 3D points that float in space. So here we've got an image of the fourth rail bridge up here, uh, just north of Edinburgh. And you'll see it's just basically a series of points, and they've been colored up depending on their height. We've obviously used a red color because that's the color of the actual bridge. But the, the lighter colors, the bluer colors, they're lower down in the, in, the, uh, in the vertical axis, and the red colors, the brighter colors are higher up. So what, this is the raw data that is captured, and from this data, uh, the LiDAR processing companies derive the terrain model and also the surface model. And where available, we obviously make the point cloud data available through Digimap as well. So there's another image of it. I'll come back to that in a bit because I'm going to show you the actual um, products in, uh, in a GIS application so you can see what they look like. Now, the final type of product that we've got as part of the LiDAR collection is some vertical aerial photography. This was captured during the capture of the um, DTM, the DSM, and the point cloud data. So again, it's fairly patchy coverage, and it covers uh, flooding sort of areas at high risk of flooding. <clears throat> so there's four different versions of aerial photography that have been captured, um, depending on what, uh, what they were using it for at the time. So there's a true color, which features the three channels, the red, the green, and the blue, which is what you'd be familiar with from things like Google Maps, and also anybody that subscribes to the aerial Digimap collection, that's what's available through there. There's a four-band version, which is RGBN, where N is the near-infrared. There is also a separate near-infrared version, which has just got that near-infrared band split off. So you can do different types of analysis with that. And then the final one is some nighttime imagery. And that's what we've got on the right-hand side. That little example is a nighttime image of uh, London Waterloo. And you can see the uh, London Eye here lit up. So nighttime imagery is really useful. It's really interesting just to, to look around and see what you see from the sky at night, but also it's really interesting for studies around light pollution, things like that in, in urban areas. So before we go on, uh, I just wanted to run a very quick poll just to get an idea of what software everybody uses for their GIS and mapping data. Okay, so that's most people voted. So uh, basically the split there is most people are using uh, ArcGIS and QGIS, which is interesting to know. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for, for taking the time to fill that in. Okay, so moving on. Right, before we look at uh, any of the formats and uses of the data, what I want to do is just to show you the actual application itself. So LiDAR is available through this LiDAR button here. We've not got a Roam viewer for this data. Um, but it's available to download. And we've got our traditional downloader, but also we've got our new LiDAR download available here. So we're going to jump into the new one. If you've not had time to look at this, this is a new version of data download. It's a beta release at the moment, so please, if you have any comments, let us know. But we've tried to replicate all the functionality of the old client to a new look and feel. Uh, so everything's still the same. You can choose your area, you choose your products, and you add them to your basket. But what I wanted to show you in this area is some of the distribution of this data. So you've got an idea for how this data uh, is available in the areas that it's available for. I'm just going to look at the DTM data here to show you. So the most detail we've got is 25 centimeters, as I mentioned uh, earlier. If we turn on the availability grid, um, you can't really see where this is. But the selected areas have been highlighted in pink. Uh, so let's just zoom to the north of England a bit. So here you can see, if I zoom in a bit further, you'll see they've got some 25 centimetre data covering the Humber estuary and then further across to Leeds, Pontefract, Barnsley area. 
Manchester. So these are all areas where uh, subject to flooding and the data has been captured. So the 25 centimetre data, and you can see some more around the east coast of England, around the Wash, these are all coastal flooding areas. So you can see the distribution of that. It doesn't cover a great deal of the country. If we look at the 50 centimetre, you'll see there's slightly better coverage. So around the Humber estuary, it goes a lot further, and it goes further um, upriver to the north there. And the, the coverage of the 50 centimetre is a bit better, if we then turn on the one meter data, you'll see we've got a whole load more data available for, for one meter. And if we turn on the two meter, just to give you an idea, two meter, we've got much more coverage. So the whole of England uh, is around 72% covered at the moment by LIDAR data. So even at the most coarse resolution, two meters, that's still a lot better than what you would get from Ordnance Survey in terms of their digital terrain model, which the best you can get from Ordnance Survey is five meter. So this is still a lot more detailed than you can get from there, even at the most coarse resolution. But some areas benefit from having data scanned and available right down to 25 centimeters. So that's uh, the availability, just to show you how that works uh, and where it's available for. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you was actually what it looked like in a, in a system. So here I've just zoomed in. This is uh, QGIS, um, which is uh, an open source GIS application. Uh, I've just zoomed into Pool on the south coast just to show you some of that data. So here we are, there's Bournemouth Pool. And we're just looking, I've zoomed into this, uh, this sort of spit, this feature, Rockley Sands uh, to the east of the city. Uh, and there's a river estuary here. Um, and I've downloaded some of the data from LiDAR Digimap. And the first thing I'm going to turn on is a DTM. So this is a DTM. Uh, I think this one was, um, I think this was the 25 centimeter data. So it's really detailed. You can see it's familiar. You can make out features. We've got the railway going across the estuary here, and we've got different height values here. If I use the um, feature information tool, we can click on a, click on a cell and we'll get a value. So here we've got a value of 20,000. So this is actually, the height is in millimeters. So that's a height of 20 meters. And obviously if you click down at the coastline, this is a height of less than a meter. Um, so you've got a standard DTM, but it's obviously very detailed, a very detailed resolution. If I just flip back to my layers panel and turn on the DSM for the exact same area, you see we've got a whole load more data now. And I'm just gonna zoom in a bit. These features here, this is actually a caravan site. So what you're seeing here are individual caravans. Uh, and here's the car park. So if I zoom in a bit further, these are cars parked in the car park. And you see the detail of this data is fantastic. These fuzzy objects, these are trees or vegetation or hedges. So that's why they're appearing fuzzy because they're not a continuous feature like the roof of a, a caravan or a car. But again, if I just zoom in a bit further, um, and if I just click on the top of one of these features, so there we've got a feature that's around nine meters tall. And if I click to the side, we've got a bit less. So yeah, you can see the height of the actual features in this area. So 10 meters and a bit less around where it. So you can work out the height of each feature. You could do the same for tree canopies. So here our tree is 14 meters tall. Sorry, 14 meters above the ground. Um, I've not got the right one selected. I need to be on the DTM. There we go. Sorry. So if I choose our tree feature, so that's uh, 32 meters, um, but that's sitting on the ground at 14 meters. And our caravans are 12 meters tall, but they're sitting on a ground of around eight and a half meters. So that's about right. Caravans around three, four meters tall. Um, so that's what you can do with this, this data. So it's, it's really, really detailed. And, and you can see that uh, within there. I'll just go back to the layers panel. Now, I don't have the point cloud data in here. The point cloud data takes a little bit more manipulation in order to view it in a, in a GIS product. It's quite a large data set, so it's supplied in a, in a particular format. But this is the exact same area, and I've created a 3D visualization using ArcGIS Pro. So you can see now, I've tilted it 3D. So these orangey features, these are the vegetation features. You can see them, the trees. And these features at the front in the foreground of the image, these are the caravans. So you can see how it's all laid out and uh, yeah, make out the individual features. This is the beach 
and then they obviously didn't collect the data in the sea. So once it went offshore, they stopped collecting it. But this is just displayed. These are the individual points like floating in space, and it's from this that the DTM and the DSM has been derived. Okay, so the other data sets are the imagery data sets. So uh, let's turn on the true color. So there's the true color, the RGB version. So again, nice and detailed. You can make out the um, boats um, right, tool and the caravans. And here's the, oh, it's not a car park, sorry. That's a, a boat yard. They're individual boats that we were seeing in the DTM, the DSM, sorry. If we turn on the um, near infrared version. So this is where they split out the near infrared data from from the imagery so again it's identical uh, but it's just a single band of near infrared so you can do uh, image analysis type work on there and then there's also a four band version which is the rgb and n values all combined together and then finally there's some nighttime imagery now we don't have nighttime imagery for here so um, i'm just going to zoom in this is actually swindon swindon town center and um, this is just made up of four separate tiles uh, of data just to show you but in the center of the image here this is the train station so you can see the platforms lit up and here's the town center of the high street which is more illuminated than uh, surrounding areas which are residential and commercial so again it's really detailed you can zoom in and see the detail that's in there and you can make out street lights and lights around buildings things like that and uh, do light pollution type work on that okay so that's just an example to show you what the data is and um, yeah, you can open it up in a GIS application without having to do anything to it, uh, with the exception of the point cloud, which needs a little bit of work to get it in. Now, in terms of data formats, so DTM, DSMs, they're provided as ASCII grid files, which most uh, GIS applications and CAD applications will open. So things like Revit, um, AutoCAD, you can load those into uh, into those products as well as GIS applications such as ArcGIS and QGIS. Point cloud data comes in LAS format, which is a compressed LAS format. So it does require a bit more work to get it in to things like QGIS and ArcGIS, um, but it can be done. Um, I believe it will go straight into to, uh, Revit, which is an Autodesk product for BIM type 3D modeling work. And then finally, the aerial photography, again, is supplied in ECW format. That's enhanced compressed wavelet. Um, and it, it's a compressed image format, effectively. But again, most applications will read that without too much trouble. So just to run through a few examples, I don't have any slides or uh, images of this, but just to give you some ideas of how LiDAR data might be useful in different applications. So the obvious one is flood modeling, coastline management. That's what a lot of this data was captured for in the first place. But to do accurate modeling of, uh, of flooding, you need really accurate data. So obviously, the, the more accurate LiDAR data that's available down to 25 centimeters is really good for this. And that's why the data was captured by the organizations originally. Another application of LiDAR data is in forest management. Um, anything to do with trees, planning, environmental areas. Again, because you can derive accurate tree height information from that. So you can um, calculate things like tree canopies, um, do insurance work, proximity of trees to buildings. You can infer the root size based on the size of the tree canopy, things like that. Archaeology is another area that LIDAR is really good for. Um, it's actually one of the key areas that people are using now, key data sets people are using now to identify new archaeological sites. Because effectively, LIDAR data, it sees through vegetation. So when you're up in the air and you take an aerial photograph, you can't see the ground underneath that. But because LIDAR detectors are really sensitive and they can detect the different wavelengths that bounce back when they fire these pulses of, of uh, lasers at the ground, they can determine what's tree canopy or vegetation cover and also what's the actual bare earth beneath that. So using LIDAR, you can actually pick out features that are buried uh, and not visible through vegetation. And obviously, it's really detailed as well. So you can capture features uh, that you couldn't otherwise see very easily. Um, <clears throat> vegetation studies, environmental studies, so identifying tree canopies. So there's, uh, there's various examples of this online. Um, a classic methodology is to look for features at least two and a half meters tall and more than two meters away from buildings. And from that, you can infer that it's likely to be a tree. And you can work out tree canopy and, and volume sizes from there. 
And then the final one that's mentioned there is around 3D modeling, um, view shed analysis type work. So you can take this open data, this LIDAR data, combine it with uh, building data sets such as Open Map Local, and you can generate fairly accurate 3D buildings. So you can combine the two data sets. You've got the height data based on the digital train model and the digital surface model, and you combine that with a polygon data set, and you can create 3D buildings. And again, most GIS and CAD applications have got 3D viewing functionality built into them these days, and you create really detailed 3D models. So in terms of uh, future plans around LiDAR data, the Environment Agency recently um, did a press release where they said they were going to capture all of England uh, in LiDAR data, LiDAR format by 2020, so just a couple of years from now. So that will be at least in the two meter resolution. So they're going to fill in all the gaps that we don't have LiDAR data at the moment by 2020, which is really good. But obviously that only covers England. The Environment Agency's remit is just for England. Uh, there haven't been similar um, statements from SEPA for Scotland or Natural Resources for Wales for Wales, but um, that may well come online as well. Um, we will be updating the data in Digimap to ensure that we've got the latest versions available as and when they're released. So, um, yeah, do bear in mind that the data will be updated. And if possible, we'll make previous available versions available for download. We'll leave them in the system so you can download them. There are lots and lots of information resources online. Um, a lot of this data, well, the LiDAR data was released as open data. So there are lots of tutorials and case studies and examples of how to use this data in specific packages. There's a few links there to how to use it in QGIS and ArcGIS, um, which may be useful to, to those that use those products. But again, there's, there's lots of other resources available. Um, loads of people have done interesting things with this data. Um, and because it's open data, so it's freely available, not just to academic use, but also for commercial use as well. So lots of people have done interesting things. So have a look. If, you, if you're interested in using the data for a particular purpose, have a quick search and see if anybody's done something similar beforehand, because you may well find a good example or some good instructions for, for doing it, and that might help you out a bit there. But that's all I really wanted to cover. I appreciate that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through, through LiDAR data and LiDAR Digimap. If anybody has any questions, please do fire away. We'll um, stick around for a few minutes and answer what we can. But anything we can't answer, we'll follow up afterwards in the transcript. But yeah, otherwise, thanks very much for attending.